third part of the introduction to the life of reason this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by fredrik karlsson the life of reason by george santayana side note heraclitus and the immediate the immediate is not however a good subject for discourse and the expounders of heraclitus were not unnaturally blamed for monotony all they could do was to iterate their master's maxim and declare everything to be in flux in suggesting laws of recurrence and a reason in which what is common to many might be expressed heraclitus had opened the door into another region had he passed through his philosophy would have been greatly modified for permanent forms would have forced themselves on his attention no less than shifting materials such a heraclitus would have anticipated plato but the time for such a synthesis had not yet arrived side note democritus and the naturally intelligible at the opposite pole from immediacy lies intelligibility to reduce phenomena to constant elements as similar and simple as possible and to conceive their union and separation to obey constant laws is what a natural philosopher will inevitably do so soon as his interest is not merely to utter experience but to understand it democritus brought his scientific ideal to its ultimate expression by including psychic existence in his atomic system he indicated a problem which natural science has since practically abandoned but which it may some day be compelled to take up the atoms of democritus seem to us gross even for chemistry and their quality would have to undergo great transformation if they were to support intelligibly psychic being as well but that very grossness and false simplicity had its merits and science must be forever grateful to the man who at its inception could so clearly formulate its mechanical ideal that the world is not so intelligible as we could wish is not to be wondered at in other respects also it fails to respond to our ideals yet our hope must be to find it more propitious to the intellect as well as to all the arts in proportion as we learn better how to live in it the atoms of what we call hydrogen or oxygen may well turn out to be worlds as the stars are which makes atoms for astronomy their inner organization might be negligible on our rude plane of being did it disclose itself however it would be intelligible in its turn only if constant parts and constant laws were discernible within each system so that while atomism at a given level may not be a final or metaphysical truth it will describe on every level the practical and efficacious structure of the world we owe to democritus this ideal of practical intelligibility and he is accordingly an eternal spokesman of reason his system long buried with other glories of the world has been partly revived and although it cannot be verified in haste for it represents an ultimate ideal every advance in science reconstitutes it in some particular mechanism is not one principle of explanation among others in natural philosophy where to explain means to discover origins transmutations and laws mechanism is explanation itself heraclitus had the good fortune of having his physics absorbed by plato it is a pity that democritus physics was not absorbed by aristotle for with the flux observed and mechanism conceived to explain it the theory of existence is complete and had a complete physical theory been incorporated into the socratic philosophy wisdom would have lacked none of its parts democritus however appeared too late when ideal science had overrun the whole field and initiated a verbal and dialectical physics so that aristotle for all his scientific temper and studies built his natural philosophy on a lamentable misunderstanding and condemned thought to confusion 
for two thousand years. Side note, Socrates and the autonomy of mind. If the happy freedom of the Greeks from religious dogma made them the first natural philosophers, their happy political freedom made them the first moralists. It was no accident that Socrates walked the Athenian agora. It was no pity patriotism that made him shrink from any other scene. His science had its root there, in the personal independence, intellectual vivacity, and clever dialectic of his countrymen. Ideal science lives in discourse. It consists in the active exercise of reason, in signification, appreciation, intent, and self-expression. Its sum total is to know oneself, not as psychology or anthropology might describe a man, but to know, as the saying is, one's own mind. Nor is he who knows his own mind forbidden to change it. The dialectician has nothing to do with future possibilities, or with the opinion of any one but the man addressed. This kind of truth is but adequate veracity. Its only object is its own intent. Having developed in the spirit the consciousness of its meanings and purposes, Socrates rescued logic and ethics forever from authority. With his friend, the sophists, he made man the measure of all things, after bidding him measure himself, as they neglected to do, by his own ideal. That brave humanity which had first raised its head in Hellas and had endowed so many things in heaven and earth, where everything was hitherto monstrous, with proportion and use, so that man's works might justify themselves to his mind, now found in Socrates its precise definition, and it was naturally where the life of reason had been long cultivated that it came finally to be conceived. Side note. Plato gave the ideal its full expression. Socrates had, however, a plebeian strain in his humanity, and his utilitarianism, at least in its expression, hardly did justice to what gives utility to life. His condemnation for atheism, if we choose to take it symbolically, was not altogether unjust. The gods of Greece were not honoured explicitly enough in his philosophy. Human good appeared there in its principle. You would not set a pilot to mend shoes, because you knew your own purpose, but what purposes a civilised soul might harbour, and in what the highest shapes the good might appear, was a problem that seems not to have attracted his genius. It was reserved to Plato to bring the Socratic ethics to its sublimest expression, and to elicit from the depths of the Greek conscience those ancestral ideals which had inspired its legislators and been embodied in its sacred civic traditions. The owl of Minerva flew, as Hegel says, in the dusk of evening, and it was horror at the abandonment of all creative virtues that brought Plato to conceive them so sharply and to preach them in so sad a tone. It was after all but the love of beauty that made him censure the poets, for like a true Greek and a true lover he wished to see beauty flourish in the real world. It was love of freedom that made him harsh to his ideal citizens, that they might be strong enough to preserve the liberal life. And when he broke away from political preoccupations and turned to the inner life, his interpretations proved the absolute sufficiency of the Socratic method, and he left nothing pertinent unsaid on ideal love and ideal immortality. Side note. Aristotle supplied its natural basis. Beyond this point, no rendering of the life of reason has ever been carried. Aristotle improved the detail and gave breadth and precision to many a part. If Plato possessed greater imaginative splendor and more enthusiasm in austerity, Aristotle had perfect sobriety and adequacy with greater fidelity to the common sentiments of his race. P. 
Plato, by virtue of his scope and plasticity, together with a certain prophetic zeal, outran at times the limits of the Hellenic and the rational. He saw human virtue so surrounded and oppressed by physical dangers that he wished to give it mythical sanctions, and his fondness for transmigration and nether punishments was somewhat more than playful if as a work of imagination his philosophy holds the first place aristotle's has the decisive advantage of being the unalloyed expression of reason in aristotle the conception of human nature is perfectly sound everything ideal has a natural basis and everything natural an ideal development his ethics when thoroughly digested and weighed especially when the meagre outlines are filled in with plato's more discursive expositions will seem therefore entirely final the life of reason finds there its classic explication side note philosophy thus complete yet in need of restatement as it is improbable that there will soon be another people so free from preoccupations so gifted and so fortunate as the greeks or capable in consequence of so well exemplifying humanity so also it is improbable that a philosopher will soon arise with aristotle's scope judgment or authority one knowing so well how to be both reasonable and exalted it might seem vain, therefore, to try to do afresh what has been done before with unapproachable success, and instead of writing inferior things at great length about the life of reason, it might be simpler to read and to propagate what Aristotle wrote with such immortal justness and masterly brevity. But times change, and though the principles of reason remain the same, the facts of human life and of human conscience alter a new background a new basis of application appears for logic and it may be useful to restate old truths in new words the better to prove their eternal validity aristotle is in his morals greek concise and elementary as a greek he mixes with the ideal argument illustrations appreciations and conceptions which are not inseparable from its essence in themselves no doubt these accessories are better than what in modern times would be substituted for them being less sophisticated and of a nobler stamp but to our eyes they disguise what is profound and universal in natural morality by embodying it in images which do not belong to our life our direst struggles and the last sanctions of our morality do not appear in them the pagan world because its maturity was simpler than our crudeness seems childish to us we do not find there our sins and holiness our love charity and honour the greek too would not find in our world the things he valued most things to which he surrendered himself perhaps with a more constant self-sacrifice piety country friendship and beauty and he might add that his ideals were rational and he could attain them while ours are extravagant and have been missed yet even if we acknowledge this greater good fortune it would be impossible for us to go back and become like him to make the attempt would show no sense of reality and little sense of humour we must dress in our own clothes if we do not wish to substitute a masquerade for practical existence what we can adopt from greek morals is only the abstract principle of their development their foundation in all the extant forces of human nature and their effort toward establishing a perfect harmony among them these forces themselves have perceptibly changed at least in their relative power thus we are more conscious of wounds to stanch and wrongs to fight against and less of goods to attain the movement of conscience has veered the centre of gravity lies in another part of the character 
Another circumstance that invites a restatement of rational ethics is the impressive illustration of their principle which subsequent history has afforded. Mankind has been making extraordinary experiments of which Aristotle could not dream, and the result is calculated to clarify even his philosophy. For in some respects it needed experiments and clarification. He had been led into a systematic fusion of dialectic with physics, and of this fusion all pretentious modern philosophy is the aggravated extension. Socrates' pupils could not abandon his ideal principles, yet they could not bear to abstain from physics altogether. They therefore made a mock physics in moral terms, out of which theology was afterward developed. Plato, standing nearer to Socrates and being no naturalist by disposition, never carried the fatal experiment beyond the mythical stage. He accordingly remained the purer moralist, much as Aristotle's judgment may be preferred in many particulars. Their relative position may be roughly indicated by saying that Plato had no physics, and that Aristotle's physics was false. So that ideal science in the one suffered from want of environment and control, while in the other it suffered from misuse in a sphere where it had no application. End of Introduction Part 3